coming up on this week's show. I find out how to stop holiday selfies putting animals at risk. Poacher hunt them in the forest because they are quite cute. Oh, Chico's holding my hands, yes. Hello, Chico. We're hunting for icebergs on a budget. Plus, we go underground in search of London's hidden rivers. We're so far down there, we can actually hear the Circle and District line rumbling through. talking selfies. Taking a photo of your travels to share on social media is an essential part of a trip for many people, and some will go to great lengths to get that perfect snap. But now major charities and social media giant Instagram are asking tourists to stop and think before you snap a photo with animals, wherever you are in the world. I'm heading to the Wildlife Friends Foundation, three hours drive south of Thailand's capital, Bangkok, to find out what's being done to help animals that have been used in the tourist industry. The 165-acre complex houses a rescue center and Thailand's first wildlife hospital. There's also a refuge for elephants. So there are plenty of photo opportunities. If I go on Instagram and search for, say, elephant selfie, under that, under that hashtag, there's almost 15,000 posts. But when I click on that hashtag, I get a warning that says, protect wildlife on Instagram. Animal abuse and the sale of endangered animals or their parts is not allowed on Instagram. The page asks the poster to be wary when paying for photo opportunities with exotic animals. It's an issue charities are trying to tackle on the ground. So how big a problem is are these animal selfie pictures? It's huge, it's huge. Let me just show you a few of the things that I've come across with my time working here in Thailand. Uh, example here we have oh. a, a gibbon uh, being used as a, a, a photo prop animal. It's very, very common to see a baby gibbon or a slow loris being carted around by a guy. And people will pay maybe one or 200 baht to have that one second selfie. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and sadly, it's a lifetime for that animal. There's a few more here. Uh, this is a What's liger. What's he riding on? This is a liger. Oh my gosh. It, which is a cross between a tiger and a lion. And the liger is the biggest wild cat you can have but this guy's riding it a lot of these animals are just beaten into submission oh. so this animal here you can't see unless i zoom but look he's on a oh, very very short, short chain thing. but they're huge huge dangerous animals they have massive canines and huge claws and if that animal does have a little flinch in its mind to think oh I'm, i, I want to attack this person it's god over. forbid what would happen to to, to you and this is a family, look, we don't know if that animal's got diseases or vice versa. These guys could have a common cold and that's very easy for it to be transmitted between the great apes. Infant animals are particularly vulnerable to the photo prop trade. Here in the wildlife hospital, babies that have been rescued or abandoned are cared for in the nursery. Vet On takes me behind the scenes to meet them. Oh, he's hungry. Oh, hi. Hi, little guy. Can you tell me a bit, a bit about langurs? Why are they so popular in the photo prop industry? Because then when, when, when they were born, their fur is completely full of orange and with like pinky face. They are so, so cute. They are quite popular to be appealing people to want to take a photo. Mm. He's still cute now. Hi. And how old's Vincent now? For now, he's around six months old. Looking after animals like Vincent is painstaking work. Some have complex needs, like slow loris chin. He was previously kept as a pet, and the vets here say a poor diet and lack of sunlight caused him to develop bone disease. Hi. Sorry to wake you. <laughs> Hi. So the loris is on the endangered list, isn't it? Yes. Poacher hunt them in the forest because they are quite cute. They have the big eyes in the south of Thailand or tourist place. They are quite popular to bring them for, to take a photo for the tourist and pay money for that. Oh, you poor little guy. So he wants to climb now. Okay, <laughs> let's give you some exercise then. 
On gives Chin daily physiotherapy and lets him get used to the sunlight again. Slowly, his condition is improving. In the wild, these animals would hold on to their mothers throughout infancy. So they instinctively cling on to each other to try and recreate the warmth and security they would normally get from their parents. Hi this guys. Is our baby long tail macaque. Wow. Bunma and Pearl. One male and one female. Hi Bunma. Hi Pearl. <laughs> so have I got Bunma? This one Bunma. And Bunma, why? Why does he want that one? <laughs> Don't try and steal pearls. So the owner brought her from like market. It okay. means like her mother was killed by poacher. So sad. Yeah, so, so sad. sad. It's nice that they've got each other now. That yeah. They're... They know like they have each other's. This good thing for them. Look at these sweet little baby macaques, Pearl and Bunma. I love how they're so affectionate with each other. Oh, it's too young to be separated from their mother. Removing a young animal from its parents impacts their behaviour for life. Tom takes me to meet two Indonesian orangutans whose staff are trying to reteach wild habits to. Maggie was found abandoned near the rescue centre. Chico grew up in the photoprop industry and was then kept as a pet. He was given to the team here when he became too big to handle. We have carers, that Sean and Tua, who bring Maggie and Chico into the forest every day and we encourage them to climb in the trees, usually by throwing fruits into the trees, wrapped in okay. vines or something like that. We were hoping that he would copy Maggie, who is more wild. Chico is a little bit more fond of humans. Uh, he's coming to say hello now. Okay. Hey, Chico. Should I be worried? It's okay, just stay, Hi, Chico. Ca just stay calm. Oh. Just stay calm. Hello. Okay. Yes. Oh, Chico's holding my hands. Yes. Hello, Chico. Oh, hi. Hi, I think Chico likes my shoes. I didn't quite expect that a human interaction. He's, he's almost like a small child. Um, does that hark back to the days when he was used as a photo prop or even a pet? So he does have a, a, an unnatural attachment to humans. He would have been put from the wild as a very young infant. He's been with humans most of his life. We're trying to uh, erase that to a certain extent, but the, the stark reality of a photo prop animal, it, it's not all fun and games like we just saw then. Uh, yes, he was having fun with you, but if he was to do that to a tourist, he would get beaten with a stick, and that's how they can control these animals. So Chico could probably never be released back into the wild? I wouldn't like to say never, but it, it, it would be a long process to rehabilitate him to a state where he would uh, be a release candidate. It's great to see Chico, and I want to know how to help other animals like him. What people should do when they see things like this is safely try and take video footage or photographs, the location, the animal, so we can identify the species, mm -hmm. if it's got a high level of protection. It then needs to be reported to the relevant authorities and ourselves here at WFFT, because we can also inform the, de the Department of National Parks and the authorities to act. And if you're taking a photo with an animal, the advice is to keep a safe distance and assess the condition it's being held in. There are national parks and sanctuaries throughout Thailand where people can experience wildlife in a responsible way. Here at the foundation, tourists are encouraged to roll up their sleeves, get dirty and help care for the rescued animals. And that's far more rewarding than taking a selfie to share with your friends. The skin is quite tough actually. It's hard going here. <laughs> I think she's enjoying it. I might be getting a bath too. <laughs>
Or you could go shopping at one of the night markets, which are largely undercover. This one's Rod Fai in the north of the city. It's kitsch and fun, and as ever, some of the street food there is wonderful. Muay Thai, or kickboxing, is Thailand's national sport, and a visit to one of the big arenas is rarely a boring experience. Tickets to the big fights cost around 1,000 baht, which is just over 30 US dollars. Or if you're feeling incredibly brave, you could book yourself into one of the camps that will train you up and harden you into a Muay Thai machine. Or for something more mindful, how about spending some time getting in touch with your inner monk? Some monasteries, like Bunya Wad, here in the northeast, allow tourists to stay in exchange for a small donation and a little bit of elbow grease. You'll need to be respectful and follow all the rules, but you might pick up a little spiritual enlightenment along the way. Still to come on this week's travel show. We'll be finding out why this Italian village is so unlucky. And Simon's back with his tips on Italian train travel and the cheapest way to see an iceberg. Next up to the UK, where a new exhibition called London Mithraeum has opened, showcasing a reconstruction of the Temple of Mithras, built by the Romans in the third century along the banks of one of the city's rivers. That river, like many in the capital, was long ago paved over and forgotten. But one man wants Londoners and tourists to know more about the city's hidden rivers. We went to meet him. I've been living in London now for about 39 years, but it wasn't until about seven years ago I first discovered these hidden rivers. And I just wanted to write and illustrate about them, to show them to other people, Londoners, tourists. The River Fleet starts on Hampstead Heath and flows five miles down to Blackfriars. One of my favourite parts of the River Fleet is here on Hampstead Heath. This is the beginning of the River Fleet. You can, you can see the water bubbling up just here and running through. It isn't hidden at this point, it's, it's very exposed in streams and ponds. The, the, the history of London is, is very much bound up with the River Fleet as well. Uh, the Romans used it, uh, it was used for powering mills, uh, then people started to use it to throw rubbish away and Smithfield Market, they were throwing offcuts of meat and gore and blood into the river, dead animals were thrown into the river, uh, it, then it became foul and stinking and so sadly they, they had to cover it up. When I was writing the book, I had to get inside the sewers to see what they were like. We all got donned up in white overalls, hard hats, waders, even a small oxygen supply. The thing that surprised me most was it wasn't as smelly as I thought it was going to be. These sewers, they started building them in the 1860s, beautifully engineered. The tiles down there are still in very good condition given you know, their age. In places, it's big open caverns with huge metal doors. There are some narrow little corridors that you have to sort of scoot through. One interesting thing I found was we're so far down there, we can actually hear the Circle and District line rumbling through. And another part of what makes the River Fleet so special is it's shaped the way some of the roads run because these footpaths would run down the side of the river and roads now follow that same route. But there are still traces of the river if you know where to look where buildings have been constructed around the stream, not over the stream. And there are manhole covers where you can peer down and see the river, or the sewer as it is now below. I would imagine that most of the commuters coming out of King's Cross Station are totally unaware that there is a, a river flowing in front of them here, although subterranean, of course. Here's an example of the River Fleet as it curves around. King's Cross. It reflects on the architecture here. The hotel to my left is curved as it follows the line of the river. Above me here is the Hoban Viaduct and it's a great reminder that there is still a river flowing underneath. This Viaduct was built by the Victorians in the 1860s. The problem was, because we're in quite a steep river valley here, 
horse-drawn vehicles simply found it difficult getting from one side to the other, down the hill, up the hill. So they built this viaduct to alleviate the problem. I'm standing here by the Thames and at this point at Blackfriars Bridge is where the River Fleet flows into the Thames. I think when people walk around London, they're not aware of how many hidden rivers there are. I wanted to show people the little clues and signs and the history of what is just beneath their feet. Time now for our global guru, Simon Calder, to answer your travel questions. Welcome to the slice of the show that tackles your questions about getting the best out of travel. Coming up, where should friends from the UK and New Zealand converge to celebrate their 40th birthday? And hunting for icebergs on the cheap. First though, all eyes are on Russia, where the Football World Cup takes place in the second half of June and the first half of July. Fans with a ticket for at least one game can explore the country, not just during the tournament, but for two weeks before and afterwards. Next, Tina Eager is off to Italy. She'll be staying in the beautiful and historic city of Bologna, but she wants to make day trips to Venice, to Florence and to Ravenna. I've seen conflicting advice about reserving tickets on trains and whether it's necessary. Should I reserve now, reserve later, or just buy a ticket on the day of travel? Bologna is the rail hub for northern Italy, and you can reach Venice in 90 minutes on a high-speed train. Book a super economy ticket in advance on the Trenitalia website and you could pay less than 30 euros there and back. Turn up on the day and it will cost you more than twice as much. Florence is also served by high speed train in less than half an hour. But I recommend when you come back from Florence to Bologna, you use the old slow railway line, which winds through spectacular scenery. And Ravenna is just 80 minutes away with plenty of trains and if you turn up and go it will cost you just 8 euros each way. Emma Eggleton lives in the UK and along with another British friend wants to meet up with a friend from New Zealand to celebrate their 40th birthdays in September. The question is where? We're looking for somewhere between the UK and New Zealand with warm weather, a pool, maybe even a beach. It's proving tricky to find somewhere that will work for all of us. Thailand offers a combination of easy access, good beaches and low costs. The trouble is in September the weather will be hot and humid. So my top choice for both low cost overall and a great experience is Greece. In September, you and your British friend will be able to get there and back for next to nothing, so you might want to subsidise your New Zealand friend for her much longer, more expensive trip. Base yourselves in Athens for a cultural treat and then head out for an island escape. Finally, John Ash from Exeter in southwest England has a simple question. What's the cheapest way I can see an iceberg? For a cut price encounter with a floating mountain of ice, head for Canada's Iceberg Alley. This is a patch of sea extending from the coast of Labrador down to St John's on the island of Newfoundland. You can fly to St John's from London in about six hours and the optimum time to be there is late May, when a flight will cost you around £500 return. If you want to know where to go when, then the Travel Show is here to help. Just email the Travel Show at bbc.com and I'll do my very best to find you an answer. From me, Simon Calder, the Global Guru, bye for now and see you next time. Finally this week, we meet the residents of Colabraro in southern Italy. The village is said to be so cursed it's unlucky to say its name. Materia, ho detto che andavamo a mangiare nel ristorante. Quando sapevano che eravamo di, di questo paese, si allontanavano. 
Eh? Colobrama. Sì, sì. Sì, Colobrama, ci mancherebbe. Sì, sì. La fama sinistra del nostro paese risale agli anni 40, quando il Podestà del nostro paese a Matera affermò che se ciò che aveva detto non fosse stato vero sarebbe caduto un lampadario. Sembra che questo lampadario cadde. Allora è capitato che è andato a Matera e diceva che volete vedere che cade il campo del lampadario. Veramente un lampadario non era attaccato buono e è caduto. La notizia si propagò a macchia d'olio e Colobraro divenne il paese innominabile, il paese che non si poteva nominare perché foriero di Ella. Il Colobraro deriva da Colubar che significa serpi, luogo dove abitano presenze malvagie, quindi fisiche e metafisiche. Inoltre la fama sinistra, eh, sempre in epoche ancora più remote, è data dalla presenza a Colobraro di Masciare. Quello che gli facevano male alla testa. Allora se gli facevano male alla testa qualcuno, andavano dalle vecchiette, si facevano fare l'affascino. Quello che la sapevano fare. Mettevano in una bacinella l'acqua, un po' di sale e del carbone. Eh. Hai capito? e poi gli lavavano la fronte e poi quest'acqua qua la buttavano in un crocivia che dove, esempio, doveva passare un altro e prenderci la fascia eh, su e che ma erano storie eh, adesso non c'è più nessuno è inutile che loro vogliono baccagliare che non esistono proprio più non è rimasta molta gente che ci può dire tanto addirittura c'è qualcuno che dice che queste cose non si possono dire e soprattutto non si possono dire quando non c'è la luce del sole perché le cose di magia non sono cose di questo mondo. Well, that's it for this week. Join us next week when... Krista visits Amsterdam, where 23 million visitors are expected by the end of the decade to find out how this historic city plans to cope with the crowds. And in the meantime, you can join us on our adventures or share your travels with the Travel Show team on social media. But until then, from all of us here in Thailand, it's goodbye.